Welcome to Masters of Product Management, powered by Sequent Learning Networks, a show that provides extraordinary insights for product managers who want to go faster and farther in their product management careers. Hello, this is JJ Rory, Vice President at Sequent Learning Networks. In our Masters of Product Management podcast, we tap into experiences of people who work in and around product management to help you learn and grow in your product management career. We're going to be talking today about rebuilding century-old products for the modern consumer. There are many products that stand the test of time and become embedded in consumers' lives. Think banking, healthcare, insurance, or depending on where you live, taxi cabs. For decades at a time, we consumers are content in how we interact with these products until someone comes along and disrupts the experience in ways we didn't even know possible. If you ask someone 20 years ago how they do their banking, most people would point to the physical branch locations, but few of us would say that today. 10 years ago, if someone said, just jump in that stranger's car and he'll take you where you want to go, most people would have said you're crazy. Now, I can be in Chelsea trying to get up to my office and watch 10 open taxi cabs pass me by as I wait for my Uber because I'm now committed to this new shared economy app-based experience. Well, there are a handful of companies attempting to disrupt the customer experience in the insurance industry. And our guest today is here to share some insights into how an organization and a product team can carry out this type of legacy product transformation. Kate Terry is co-founder and chief operating officer at Surround Insurance, an insure tech startup building products for urban professionals living in sharing, renting, and gigging economy. Prior to this role, she spent more than 12 years in product management roles in the insurance industry, including six years as the senior vice president in commercial product management at Liberty Mutual. Kate, thank you so much for joining me today. I'm happy to be here. So can you tell us what it means to you to rebuild century-old products for the modern consumer? Yeah, absolutely. So if you think about insurance and you wanted to describe some of the insurance that you bought, you'd probably describe it as home insurance or auto insurance if you were in the property and casualty space. And that's because insurance is really about assets. It was designed out of um, you know, a need, um, sometimes 100 years ago, sometimes 70 years ago. And it's all about things, not people. The thing is, though, is that the economy is shifting, as, as you pointed out, right? We're moving from a world of assets and ownership to a world of access and sharing. But the issue is, is that those um, insurance products that um, have this, this long, long legacy and this storied past really haven't caught up. Um, so for us, we, we look at that and we say, hmm, there's been this insure tech revolution where there's been, you know, billions of dollars flowing into the insurance space to try to modernize the customer experience. Um, a lot of it has been in distribution um, or in the back office where there were a lot of inefficiencies like any old industry. Um, and now it's time to tackle the product and to design it around people's lives rather than around the things that people purchased in the past. It's fascinating. I, I love the what you said. It's it's about things, not people, right? And I think, honestly, I think a lot of products um, outside the insurance industry get get into that rut as well. So, so what evidence led you to believe that insurance products were were ready and needed to be rebuilt? Yeah. So, I had both personal experiences and professional experiences. Um, on the personal side, my my parents had, of all things, a wild turkey fly through a window in their house. And I know it was a mess. And (laughs) their insurance company said, we don't cover birds flying through windows. Now, my parents live on a golf course, right? And they said, well, what if it had been a golf ball instead? And the insurance company said, oh, well, we would cover that. Right. So what's the disconnect? Right. From a consumer's perspective, it's exactly the same thing, except that a turkey is a lot grosser than a golf ball when it's inside your house. Right. Um, and then on the professional side, I was having similar experiences. In my last role, among among other things, um, I had a team of uh, dozens of PhD statisticians and actuaries who were building all of the pricing models for our commercial lines. And they were using all those technologies that are, you know, kind of buzzwords, but also really cool machine learning, right, um, and other kinds of, of advanced computational techniques. Um 
but all of it was about taking and when you're doing that kind of work, right, you're taking an existing old product that's a commodity and trying to find the next, you know, 0.1% improvement in setting the price. And I just watched that for a while and I thought, you know, there are people literally at this company that are typing names on forms that it never made sense to program. And I'm not sure that those people aren't actually adding more value for our end consumers than those of us who are sitting here, you know, describing the black box of, of insurance pricing. I'm not saying that the analytics aren't important. They're super important. But there's a tendency, I think, in, in industries that are old to apply them to improve what has already and always been there, not to actually think about the market and the customers who you're frankly so insulated from at a big old company, you don't even know what the customers want. Um, so I had a moment of this just isn't really working. And I met up with my co-founder, uh, Jay Grayson, through a mutual colleague a little bit later. And he had this, this uh, after I'd left, and he had this great idea um, around serving a particular segment that whose needs are, are really not addressed, and that's this young urban professional that we've that we've talked about before. Um, and so for these folks, it's not just that you know the turkey versus the golf ball; it's that they don't own the things that you need in order to buy insurance. Like, how do you buy auto insurance if you drive but you don't own a car, right? Um, and yet they worry. We we've done hundreds of interviews at this point all over the country. And there's this pervasive sense of uncertainty um, of people who came in age of age before and slightly after the 2008 uh, economic uh, debacle <laughs> that we've lived through, right? Um, they do things like buy life insurance so that if they die, their parents won't get stuck with their student loan balances, right? They worry at the rental car company uh, counter about whether they need to buy that $50 a day of insurance. They don't know what to do and they don't see anyone talking to them. So that's sort of the the, the customer draw for, for building a product that really um, helps them live better and calmer lives. That's fascinating. Uh, by the way, if you ever write a book on this, I, I insist that the title of that book is The Turkey Versus the Golf Ball. That's perfect. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I love that. that. You can have it. Um, okay. Great <laughs> story, you. by the way. And, and just um, not just the turkey and the golf ball, but the, the professional side of things. Is, and you're spot on. Things are just so different these days, especially for that, that market that, that you're going after. Um, so what's the most difficult thing you've found about trying to transform products that have been used in a certain way for so long? Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people assume that it actually is the product. I mean, insurance products, like a lot of other old line industries, are highly regulated. Um, but one of the first things that, that Jane and I did was go out and visit regulators. And, you know, regulators are people who are, they have their jobs for the purpose of protecting consumers. And a lot of them take that mission really to heart, right? So we've had regulators in multiple states, because insurance is regulated state by state, say to us, we understand that there's some things that are broken in insurance, but you got to work within the system to fix it. And that's what you guys are trying to do. So that's not been the issue. The issue has, has the most difficult thing has actually been um, doubters in industry partners, right? So in a complex industry like insurance or any other big old line industry, you can't do it alone. Like this is not building an app in a garage and then, you know, selling it or, or mocking, throwing together some prototypes and putting it on a cart at the mall and, and seeing what you can do. Um, you need industry partners, vendor partners, and the number of them who sort of say, well, this is how things have always been done. So this is how they have to be done has been kind of incredible. What's even more incredible is that a lot of the time, there's no reason why things are the way they are, except, you know, somebody programmed something in a system that got sold throughout the industry in 1960. And so we assume that's how it's ha how it has to be. But we've had good luck. Um, you know, you don't need to convince every vendor that they want to work with you. You need one vendor for each kind of system, that sort of thing, right? So we've been telling our story uh, again and again and finding the people who are... Uh, who are kind of going to be with us on this journey, and um, and they've turned out to be incredibly supportive. Uh, I think it's just you need to, if you're trying to transform something old, you need to have a clear sense of what you're trying to do and a very thick skin for people who tell you you're crazy. 
Yeah, that that's that's great. Um, I I can only imagine that when you're trying to do something so different, right, against the grain, uh, you're going to have more no's than than yeses. Um, but those few yeses, as you said, are are the ones that that keep you going. So I applaud um, anyone who tries to to do something different um, with products and and experiences uh, that have been around for so much, especially something as complex as as an industry like like insurance. So. Um, so what kind of team have you built to tackle this problem of old insurance products? Yeah, that's a good good question. Um, from a product perspective, uh, I'm going to say something a little weird, which is that we are super, super lucky to be in an industry that's way behind other industries. And I'll tell you why. It's because we don't have to reinvent the wheel. There are amazing people out there who have done what we're doing, which is unlocking an old product and making it new or building a brand new product Playing, paying close attention to what customers actually need. So we've actually um, hired a team of, of product people, product designers, um, programmers, architects, um, who understand what a modern consumer experience feels like and understand how to iterate with the customers um, to, to help them put into words what works and what doesn't work about what could be a very complex product. It's also been great because, you know, Jay and I bring a lot of insurance know-how. We're both longtime insurance executives. Um, and we've got folks around us who take our insurance speak and turn it into language that, that people want to hear and, and understand. And so we've got this team that's got a combination of sort of tech, design, and insurance know-how, and those three together um, I think make us one of the strongest teams in this segment of, of the industry. And I'm, I'm excited about what we're building at the moment. That's wonderful. So, so what would you say, or, or, um, you know, what can other organizations learn from insure tech startups that are attempting to disrupt an industry with these longstanding products and technologies? And, and as we've said, cu customer experiences. Yeah, I'll talk first a little bit to, to motivation, and then I'll talk a little bit about some, some more factual things. Um, so you pointed out before that, that a lot of these kind of old line products are really embedded in consumers' lives, in all of our lives. And, and they may have gotten a little out of, date, out of date and out of touch, but the reason they're so embedded is because they do something that is socially good, right? Nobody wants to buy insurance, but we're there when something really bad happens. I can't control who's going to get into an accident on the freeway today, but I can be there to put them back together in the right way, treating them the right way and processing their claim as quickly as possible. You know, every day I go to work, I make life a little bit more fair. And I think as people in industries that are old and can seem dull at cocktail parties, owning that goodness and reason for being and seeing it as a, a reason to enhance our excitement and motivation to improve things for the consumer and believing that it's doable is actually really the first step. When you look at kind of more factually some things that that, um, that apply to other industries, I'd say a few things. Um, first of all, I mentioned before that insurance is a regulated industry. Not every old line industry is regulated. But the fact that something is regulated is not in and of itself a reason not to innovate, right? There are the laws and the regulations themselves. And then there's what people assume about them, which is often far more complex than what they actually say, right? And most of the regulations are intended... Um, to take care of consumers and, and how can that be too far from what you want to do as, as an ethical business person, right? So the fact that it's regulated, don't let that scare you away. The second thing I would say is that the older the industry, the more likely that there's still, you know, COBOL or something under the IT covers. And the more outdated that those IT systems are in some ways, probably the more opportunity you have um, to actually change things for the better for the customer. I think a lot of just having watched decisions inside from the inside at several different very large insurance companies over my, the course of my career, you end up having to make a lot of decisions because the system does X and Y and doing Z would cost a million dollars and it's never logical to do Z. What you need to do is rip out the system, but that'll be $500 million, right? So that, those kinds of decisions over the years, which are completely rational on a one-off basis, lead you to this point where, where your product diverges so far from the customer that it's just not serving its purpose. And then it's also really hard inside a big company to get to the consumer, um, in part because 
you know, the, the people who are closest to the consumer or the customers are trying to protect them from being overwhelmed by everyone within the company reaching out again and again, which makes sense in some ways. But you got to find a way to get out there and actually talk to people um, who are using using your product. It's super, super important. Um, so I think those are a couple of things that apply just just broadly. You know, take take heart. Look for opportunities where the systems are oldest and, and don't let regulation scare you. In some ways, all the opportunity in the world <laughs> is in the very oldest products, right? They've existed for centuries or in the case of insurance, millennia perhaps, um, and they'll continue to exist for a long time to come. So what you're doing really matters in, in building a future that's that's just and fair for all of us. I'm, I'm going to re- repeat one thing you said for those in the back. Um, <laughs> Just because an industry is highly regulated is not a reason not to innovate. I work with really highly um, highly regulated, standardized industries, so healthcare and financial services and manufacturing. And and uh, y- you would you wouldn't be surprised by this, I'm sure. Um, but frankly, it surprises me every once in a while that that folks are still saying, "Well, that's just how it works here." Um, So again, great point there. Um, And then I want to follow up a little bit on something else you said. So um, you and I have actually talked about this in the past, I believe, but consumers aren't always able to clearly articulate their needs. Right. So so we as product managers have to translate consumer speak, if you will, um, and and truly get to that core need before we start to solution. Um, so do you have any mechanisms for digging in and finding those core needs that help you ultimately dive in and develop a solution to meet those needs? Yeah. So we found asking people, can we talk about your insurance really doesn't work, <laughs> right? No, nobody wants to talk about insurance and it's not really the right approach anyway. Insurance is, is the solution, not the problem, right? It's the problem you want to go after. Um, we found that using a lot of empathy-based interviewing was really helpful in really understanding consumers' needs. And we actually didn't just talk to people who might be our insureds or subscribers, to use that word, these young urban professionals we've talked about. We also went out and we talked to their parents. We talked to insurance agents. We talked to people who work for insurance companies. And what we tried to get at was what made them feel insecure, what they worried about, what the pervasive worries were that they had in their lives, because that's really what insurance is for, right? It, it should allow you to worry less about those unfair negative lottery moments in life. And that was what turned up a whole lot of specific situations that our product design uh, designers were able to design around. I'll give you just, just one example that we wouldn't have gotten directly um, if we sort of said, you know, <laughs> Tell us about the insurance that you've bought, um, which is that that a, a moment of angst for a lot of people is standing at the rental car counter, right? You stand there, you just got off a long flight, some dude behind the counter is trying to sell you insurance and it's you know got all these weird acronyms and it's ex- as expensive as the car um, that you're actually renting, right? And there are two kinds of people in this world we've learned. There are <laughs> people who buy all of the insurance because they figure, well, at least if they do that, they'll be fine. And then there are people who assume their credit card covers the insurance at the rental car company and that's often a really incomplete complete and not completely true sort of story. And as we talked to people about worrying moments in different facets of their life, we were asking about travel and this moment came up again and again and again. And we were kind of like, huh, (laughs) that is a problem that insurance can fix. That moment of stress when you don't know what to do and you can either spend a lot of money or, you know, continue to have worries. We can, we can design around that. Um, So yeah, long story short, I think empathy-based interviews, asking people about their worries and their concerns and less about the products that have already been designed um, has been the way to go for us. Sounds great. Thanks for sharing that. So do you have any final words of wisdom for product managers and leaders out there who may be struggling a bit with how to build products or Mm -hmm. uh, changing products um, that are going to meet these evolving customer needs? Yeah. I mean, take heart. It's hard, right? If it were easy, everybody would be doing it. Um, Learn from other industries as best you can. There's a ton of material out there these days on what makes good product design, um, how to talk to customers, et cetera. And then find a way to actually get in front of your customers and understand what they need, what they think, what their concerns are about, where they spend their time and how they live their lives. It's, it's the only way that you're going to design a product that has some fidelity um, to the, the consumer group that you're trying to attract. 
What a great talk today. Thank you so much, Kate Terry, for sharing your experiences with us. It's just so exciting to hear about organizations who are attempting to truly be different and show us consumers um, and frankly, product managers as well, because we can learn from you, that we can interact with products differently and we can build things differently for our customers, um, possibly than even you know our consumers and our customers could have imagined. So again, thank you so much for sharing your experience and wisdom with us, Kate. Thanks so much for having me. You bet. So thank you for joining us on Masters of Product Management powered by Sequent Learning Networks. I am JJ Rory, and I look forward to speaking with you on the next episode. You've been listening to Masters of Product Management powered by Sequent Learning Networks. If you'd like to take your career to the next level with additional tools, training, coaching, and books, be sure to visit Sequent Learning Networks at sequentlearning.com. <laughs>